so we spent our time up to now in the carbonyl realm dealing with direct attack here um, and then when we get to the acids and the acid derivatives we're dealing with direct attack here and potentially leaving group here but in the end the only thing that we've changed for two chapters now is that one carbon so we need to kind of move on from that but we're not going to go very far what we're going to move is one carbon to the left the so-called alpha position and specifically we're going to take advantage of the fact that a hydrogen at that position is acidic specifically because of this that is a polar bond and that is inductively pulling on the next bond which is in turn pulling on this one so we take electron density away from a hydrogen and that's the definition of becoming more acidic more towards a proton with no electrons so <clears throat> um, when we're talking about relative to another functional group and it's most commonly used with carbonyl groups we will use greek letters so you'll sometimes see this the alpha one we talk about a lot the beta one we will talk about within this chapter and further out than that we don't usually say much but it's still used for some reason um, keep in mind that in the greek alphabet it doesn't go a b c it goes a b g d so you know it's a little bit strange if you're not used to it that your third letter is not a c um, and then it goes backwards in the english alphabet from g gamma to d delta so um, we won't deal with those a lot but in case you see them in other contexts just keep that in mind um, we're spending most of our time dealing with what's next to the carbonyl group and we're going to do that in a couple of different ways um, one under acidic conditions we'll typically be dealing with something called an enol um, and under basic conditions we'll be dealing with something called an enolate now that's not new is it your book doesn't call you out on that i will here's why you've seen that before last semester when you did oxymercuration and then demercuration you added you ended up at that point doing this Look familiar? It's an awful lot like that, doesn't it? It's an enol. We've been here before. We've dealt with these before. In those cases, all we did was say, well, it undergoes a process that's very favorable in equilibrium terms called tautomerization. And we end up here, where we now have a ketone there. this pi bond and this h are very crudely going to trade places so we end up with another h here and the pi bond here instead of where they were to begin with not only have you dealt with that one before but when we did hydroboration we ended up here same alkyne but our intermediate when we were almost done with it was this It's an enolate, which then with acid ends up, once we finish the reaction and get rid of this by adding acid to it as a final workup step, we end up with our carbonyl again. Same basic idea, but completely different in terms of acid or base and how we got there the regiochemistry we're not concerned with right now that's a topic for back in the alkynes chapter but the point is we dealt with enols then the oxymercuration went through one of them and we tautomerized it to a ketone we dealt with enolates then the hydroboration went through one of them and we ended up protonating it and ended up as a ketone when it was over so this is not new not even slightly so we're going to basically spend most of this chapter with enolates um, 
And the idea is that we're going to put stuff there. We're going to pull off one of those hydrogens, which was here, and we're going to end up replacing it with some other group. So not particularly difficult, but very, very useful in terms of building larger molecules, including a lot of the important ones that we'll deal with. Okay, so what's here is kind of what I said before, that enols tend to form under acidic conditions. Um, basic conditions there is a little questionable. I, I disagree with them on using that at this level, but primarily we're talking about acidic conditions. And essentially the important part of the bottom it's very unfavorable in the first place. That's what we took advantage of with oxymercuration. We didn't really have to do any work to get it to go to the ketone. The same is true in solution in general. This equilibrium is not favorable, but if you remember Le Chatelier's principle, we can still work with an unfavorable equilibrium as long as we get the unfavorable one to do something, the shift will happen to form more of it. So if I find a way to do something unique with this, then 0.001% of this will shift over to replace the vacuum that I've used up. So we can still work with very unfavorable equilibrium. That's an important concept for this chapter particularly. An unfavorable equilibrium is not a death sentence because this number here is not a zero. It's almost a zero, almost a zero, but not. So if there's any of it there, we might still be able to work with it. Hint, we wouldn't have a chapter if it wasn't workable. So. Um, generally, the only exceptions for that are if we have some way to stabilize the enol. Um, we're going to talk about this one later in the chapter, but it, it's a tricky example. We'll see the keto form being unfavorable if there's some reason for it not to be. And there's more than one version here. But this little hydrogen bond helps. But the fact that this entire four-atom four system is now conjugated when this had none of that gives you an idea. Conjugation is a big deal. Been there, done that. We did a couple chapters on that already. It isn't going away, it's still important here. So again, things to keep in mind, things you've done before. Conjugation is not new. <coughs> and this one, uh, obviously, why would we go from something like this, that's sp3, to something like this, that's sp2? Well, look what it is, it's benzene. It's aromatic. Resonance structures that go to aromatic are going to tend to want to stay there because it's a stabilizing force. Why? Cyclic conjugation. Again, not new stuff, but we're using applications of it now that we really didn't think about before. If you needed the structure on the left, quite honestly, I'm not sure how the hell you would get it. But um, the one on the right is easy. All right. So how does it work? One, this is the worst phrase imaginable and is badly misused in some textbooks. They're not doing it wrong here. I still don't like it. Um, here's the proper version. This is the proper term. Protonation. You're adding a hydrogen to a base. That's not a proton transfer. That's protonation. That's all it is. You're protonating a carbonyl group. Technically, yes, you're transferring a proton. It's a dumb term. Okay, why are you going to use more words than you have to describe something? That's pointless. So, same thing here. This is proton transfer. It's deprotonation. It's an acid-base reaction. Base, take H, the end. Don't make it out to be more than it is. I don't like vague terms. Those are not descriptive enough because they're using it in the same place to describe two different things happening. Try protonation and deprotonation. Those are specific. They tell us what we want to know. The middle, of course, as we've talked about many, many times, when we see the magic R word, we know that we're onto something that's probably likely going to happen. Resonance stabilizes a lot of different things and makes it useful. Makes whatever we're talking about a little bit more useful. Um, so that's important that this is resonance stabilized, and that's true for the enolate when we get to that later. Um, same thing, resonance stabilization of the anion. That one's a little bit more cut and dry. This is a little bit less obvious, but still, the resonance is a bigger part of the enolate right here. Why? Well, because now we actually have a resonating system all the way through. Now, they're showing you the enol formation under basic conditions. Again, I, I, I really don't think this is as realistic as they're suggesting. If you drew this on an exam, it's probably going to end up with that next to it because you're missing the point of something. This is a really strange reaction. 
Um, the enolate is what we typically work with because otherwise we're just adding an extra hydrogen to take it back off again. Eh, not really a good descriptor of mechanism in my opinion. I don't like it. I don't think it's useful. It's in your textbook. It's not. Pro it's probably not technically wrong. Okay, fine. Who cares? It's not useful. It doesn't explain anything that we couldn't do another way. And if you're under basic conditions, you're generally better off describing things as coming from the enolate, one of these structures, than going to something like this and then having to explain what happened to the, the H in the circle. Um, does it happen? Of course it does. This and this are probably very, very similar in, in pKa, so the exchange of the hydrogen is not going to be that difficult. But we try to stick to mechanistic steps that actually help us understand the overall reaction. This one does not. All right. In both cases, the enol and the enolate, the alpha position, what was our alpha carb, what, what was next to our carbonyl or still is in the resonance structure on the right, is a nucleophile. Um, we can look at that a couple of different ways. We can look at it in the way that we did in the past with an alkene and say, well, if I take that left structure, well, if I'm just thinking about something without describing what's here, well, we know what happens with that with electrophiles. We did this way back last semester. We, the alkenes add to electrophiles, so that means that technically the alkene in those conditions is acting as a nucleophile. It's not going to be any different now. It's still an alkene, it just happens to have something different here. That would be an alcohol in the enol case. Um, we can draw a resonance structure for that. We could draw a resonance structure for an alkene too. We could have just drawn this like this, and we'd have basically the same logic. Um, so it's not particularly new that we're going to use the alkene or one carbon of the alkene directly as a nucleophile. Um, again, this is a lot of things that we've seen before in this chapter, but we're putting them together in a constructive place. This is not new material. It's application to what we've already dealt with, with resonance, uh, with cation stability, and with alkene reactions to something different. So we're just applying it to a new example, but it doesn't mean it's a new material. It's not, it's not new mechanistically for you. All right, and we're going to spend a lot more time on enolates than we are enols, and there, here's the reason, because they're better nucleophiles. Why? Because I have a full anion, no matter what I do, in both of these, I have a full anion. Now, <clears throat> the question is, doesn't that create mixtures? We could look at this now and say, well, I have two different spots for the anion, which means I have two different possible nucleophiles to react with some electrophiles. So I could have oxygen attack and end up here. Very rarely will we ever see that. Or I could have the carbon anion attack and end up with alpha substitution. To give you a hint on which one of these likely happens, let's go back to the title of the chapter, alpha substitution. Hint, hint, hint. Um, why not? Why are we looking most of the time at the carbon anion and very, very rarely at the oxygen one doing anything? There is a trade-off between stability and reactivity. They are equal and opposite. They are opposite scales. One goes up, the other goes down. Which of these two, this or this, is likely to be more stable? And the answer is, well, which atom is better off at handling a negative charge is going to be the one that's got more electronegativity. So this is going to be stable. What that means, since these two are in equilibrium with each other by resonance, these are resonance structures of each other, is that this is the reactive one. So we form it, and this is what we end up with, basically exclusively. Very rarely are we going to see anything happen to the oxygen other than resonance. It reforms the carbonyl. You can either draw that during the overall attack on an electrophile, like this, or more commonly we're just going to draw it with the anion on the, neg on the carbon to begin with to give us direct attack. It's a little bit cleaner to see it this way, even though... The left case is much more realistically what's happening. The right case is clearer, especially important when we get to some of the later mechanisms that have a lot of steps. The last thing we want is to be adding extra arrows to something later in this chapter that we don't need. So we'll probably end up drawing most of our enolates like this. Um, we will occasionally have to talk about the resonance because there are other factors involved, but 
will usually draw it as just happening from the from the carbon directly like the one on the right okay so next question is well as i said with my hand drawing before is that this is a polar bond and because of that we have induction up the next carbon and that makes these more acidic um, to put that in context if i were to give you propane um, this pka is about 60 whereas if i give you acetone this is more like 20 i think it's 19 and change 19.6 somewhere around 20. so we're talking about something that is 10 to the 40th times more acidic remember pka is a logarithmic scale that is massive very few things that we're going to deal with in common usage are going to take that proton off um you know this would be like i don't know using a sledgehammer to to tack a piece of paper to the wall we really don't want to hit things that hard most of the time. We're going to damage whatever else is around. It's too it's too strong to have to pull off a proton. That non-acidic is going to require a base that is very, very hostile. Um, whereas getting this proton off, removing the proton from next to a carbonyl, is relatively simple. Um, not hard to do. We've got plenty of bases in that range that are easy to make and easy to use. So we can, we can functionalize something adjacent to a carbonyl. Um, we can put other groups there and work with them. It makes our life a lot simpler. All right. So, uh, CS of 19.6. All right. Eh, all right. Close, though. Well, we need to have some idea of the acidity. And, of course, we can look that up for most structures. And we can work it out computationally for others that were more complicated if we needed to. But basically... Um, we're looking at things in a range of like 16 to 18 most of the time, well, 16 to 19. Um, so we kind of know what we're going to need in terms of bases. We need something with a pKa uh, for the conjugate base that's a lot higher than that. So here's a bad example. <laughs> if I try to use what is still a reasonably good base with this okay acid what i get is the conjugate base out of that is not all that different these are less than one point apart this is not a good equilibrium this is not an equilibrium that's going to give you a large amount of the product what i want is for this number to be much higher so that the equilibrium would then shift to the right and i have more of this to work with and i can go off and do stuff with it there are cases where we will use this We'll deal with those in the next video. But if I want to work directly with the enolate, um, most of the time I'd rather have more of it. Here, I'm only going to have a very tiny amount of it because I don't have a base that's strong enough. Um, so we're going to have to take the base up a notch. Here it is. Now, I mentioned this one before, just in passing back in Organic 1, uh, when we talked about large bases for eliminations, that we talked about this, you know, the T-butoxide, as being a large base. And yes, it is, but not on the scale of what we need sometimes. This is a very strong base. Um, and more importantly, it is absolutely not going to act as a nucleophile because it is freaking huge. Here's what we're talking about. I have big methyl groups all up in here. So this is not going to be doing any SN2-like stuff, no matter what I put it near, because it's just too much space for anything but a hydrogen to get anywhere near that. So it can get to a hydrogen, as long as it's not one that's blocked, and that's about it. It's not going to really do anything else. It's not capable of it. It's too big. Now, that's size. We have to make sure that the numbers are right, and here they are. Here's the pKa of that conjugate base. The amine that it turns into when it gets protonated is the conjugate acid. Um, it is 36. This is 20 points higher than the actual aldehyde. This is essentially not an equilibrium. This is a blowout. So this is going to be 99.99 and probably a few more nines to the right. So we're going to have all of this. We're basically talking about quantitative conversion to the enolate. That's an important term for later. 
we're going to have other reactions that are possible later, one called the aldol particularly, that requires us to not have quantitative conversion to the enolate. So we need to be very careful when we talk about what we're going to use as our base because if we want complete enolate, meaning we don't want any of this left over because it can cause other reactions, then we use a base with a higher pKa value for its conjugate acid. If we want both of these present, we go back to using something like hydroxide or the ethoxide from the previous, previous slide. Okay, now, why is this so much more acidic? And we're going to deal with some specific reactions for dicarbonyl compounds that have one hydrogen in between, but remember, we were talking about only one of these, one carbonyl group dropping the pKa by 40 points from 60 down to around 20 for acetone. Well, what do you think two is going to do? Two is going to be pulling on them from both directions, but that is basically pulling electron density out from both directions relatively harshly. We're going to drop the pKa down compared to the other one. This is another seven times more acidic. So, sorry, seven points, 10 to the seventh. Okay, so this is 10 million times more acidic than this. So one of those is really easy. This wouldn't be an equilibrium even if you were using something like ethoxide because it, the number is so low pKa-wise comparatively. And of course, what hopefully is obvious to you after the previous few chapters, resonance is all over the place here, and anytime I can draw multiple resonance structures, that structure is very likely to be something that's going to be stable. Now, we don't use those a lot except for a couple of specific reactions near the end. So, but what they're getting at here is what I just said, is that if you have a pKa that's that low, you can get away with what would, in the other context, have been a base that wasn't strong enough. Um, so having a stronger acid here means I get away with a weaker, a weaker base here and still not have a worry, worry, worrisome equilibrium. This is, the, this is the key word, overkill. Yes, I could still use a stronger base. Why bother? You know, if you don't need the expense or the effort of using something a little bit harsher or stronger or more hazardous in the case of some of this, why do it? Um, you wouldn't. There's just no reason to take it on, aside from just pure economics that you don't want to spend the extra money. Okay, so we have to choose our bases carefully. This is a summary of what we just said. We don't want if we don't want reversibility, we got to have a base that's considerably stronger than the pKa value that we're given for our carbonyl compound. So single carbonyl compound, that means we're probably talking about LDA, um, the, the amide base from before, or something called sodium hydride, a very strong base, but not as big. Um, if we wanted equilibrium, which we will in the aldol reaction later, we use a weaker one, the sodium hydroxide or sodium ethoxide. Um, if we have two ketones or two carbonyl groups, beta to each other, meaning only one set of alpha hydrogens between them. Um, then we get away with pretty much the weaker bases, and it's not going to matter because it's so acidic, it doesn't take a good base to do the job.